now to have the the keynote for the expo. So it's with pleasure that I introduce Mike Kaiser, Government Relations and External Affairs, NBA Hub. And Mike is the <coughs> Principal, Government Relations and External Affairs for NBN Co. Mike is an electrical engineer, good background for you, by profession. He has extensive experience with government, having served premiers in New South Wales and Queensland. As Chief of Staff, He's also worked in the private sector in a consultancy capacity on the delivery of major infrastructure projects. The keynote today is the benefits of NBN. Would you please welcome our keynote speaker, Mike Tyson. Thanks very much, and um, my apologies for arriving late. Um, flights out of Sydney, uh, Hickory, uh, a late flight out of Sydney, Hickory, is probably here about half an hour later than I was hoping to be. So, um, my apologies. Uh, I guess once we've got to the end, we could have appeared today via high speed video conference map, um, and put those old fashioned businesses like airlines that don't like to stick to, uh, to the uh, timetable of their business maps. Um, thanks very much for the opportunity to, uh, to come to the town I, I, I'm a frequent visitor here and um, I like the place. Uh, and we've also got a first release site here in the town of course, um, for the National Court and Network. So uh, we're all going to come to frequent visitors here and check on what's going on in the partnership with the Irvine Bill and then the Bill for us. Um, what I want to do today is just provide you with a, bit of a, a, a little bit of a rationale for the National Court Bank Network and also then talk specifically about some experiences down in Tasmania where the network is already up and going and people are already experiencing the benefits of certain class broadband. Uh, and then leave you with a bit of a challenge for small business operators. First of all, I want to talk about some of the, some of the trends that are driving the need for this kind of initiative in Australia at the moment. One of the trends is uh, the inexorable rise in the speeds that new software applications are requiring of broadband. Um, it wasn't that long ago where all you had was dial-up, um, and many people in Australia, or many people, it's still all they had. Uh, but the new applications that are being developed in health and education and telepresence, really anything to do with a screen is demanding higher and higher speeds and more and more broadband. In fact, broadband usage in Australia, just the amount of downloaded data, is increasing by roughly 40% a year. The problem with that, though, is that the, the creaky old copper pipes installed by, uh, installed by the forerunner to Telstra, which are now 60 years old, were simply never designed for broadband, let alone high-speed broadband. They were designed only for voice calls. And yet that's still what we're trying to ring the last little bit of broadband capacity out of the country. But it's not the case elsewhere. Elsewhere, countries are moving at a rapid pace to installing fibre to the premise access networks, optical fibre, almost, almost limitless broadband capacity uh, and extremely high speed download and upload abilities. So, one trend is the increase in speed and broadband capacity. The other trend is, that's very concerning, is the fact that other countries are moving well beyond Australia when it comes to installing these new futuristic modern broadband capacity networks. Sadly, when you look at that chart, which is a chart of penetration rates of fibre to the uh, fibre to premises, whether they're homes or businesses, when you look at that list, who's at the top, South Korea, Japan, there's even Estonia and Bulgaria, but Australia does not appear on that list. Australia is still trying to bring broadband capacity out of a network that was essentially designed and built 60 years ago in many places that was never designed for broadband. So what's the solution? The solution is 
uh, genuinely super fast national broadband network, uh, built with three technologies, optical fiber technology for 93% of premises across the country. Those are the red dots where our population is incredibly concentrated. Those red dots, believe it or not, cover 93% of premises in the country. Uh, High-speed wireless technology, fixed wireless technology, not mobile, fixed the, uh, devices in premises and businesses, uh, which are the grey circles that you see, the grey areas that you see, and then high-speed AA band satellites, two new satellites launched in 2015 to cover some 300,000 premises, the last, what we call the last couple of percent, two or three percent of premises in very, very remote locations. Everyone focuses on EDENCO as an infrastructure project, and it is that. It's a, it's a large piece of nation building. Uh, we're likely to the Snowy Mountain Scheme, the Sydney Harbour Bridge, all those comparisons are made in terms of the transformational effects that the National Broadband Network might have as a piece of infrastructure. What I think is also exciting about this project is that it's an industry reform. It's about separating this telecommunications industry, which is full at the moment of vertically integrated players who are wholesalers selling capacity to themselves and then on selling it to, uh, to you into a number of layers. We are a wholesale only network. We don't sell to end users, we sell to other retailers. So, retailers like Optus, IINet, TPG, uh, Telstra, all of those under this new industry model won't have to invest a cent in building networks. They'll buy that capacity from us at a uniform price across the nation. They can devote all of their efforts into what retailers should devote their efforts to, and that's innovation, good service, price competition. So I mentioned the uh, first release site that we had in council, one of five across the, uh, across the nation. Uh, it's progressing well. We're one to two months away from completing construction. As I mentioned, Ergon are our construction partners, a uh, very great brand, a very good name, um, a solid partner in this exercise with the Siri Council. And uh, construction was delayed, unfortunately, by the bad weather that had been recently. Ergon told us they had something better to do for a couple of weeks than uh, build our network. So we're a bit disappointed about that, but I understand that they had something better to do. Um, what's really interesting is that 63% of premises in that footprint, 63% of that 2,500 premises, have consented, they have to specifically consent to us connecting their premise to the network. Uh, and 63% of uh, premise owners did that. That's an extraordinarily high figure when you consider that we're not operating service here. We are offering merely the promise of better broadband down the track when we get retail partners on board with this network on. And yet the people in this first release site, the residents and businesses in this first release site, to the, to the tune of 63%, not even knowing what the price would be, not even knowing what the service would be, were so keen on merely the promise of that world again that they are prepared to allow us to connect their friends. I mentioned the National Broadband Network is a wholesale only operator uh, building a network across the nation. It's not our business to deliver services to anyone other than our customers who are the retail service providers like the offices and the, I, and the, I, the, the IINets and the internodes. Uh, but what we do expect to happen, and this is really one of the points of my presentation today, is that we expect, given the opportunity now, for there to be a lot of activity in the application space, business applications, telepresence, school and telemedicine applications to develop now. And we're seeing this already in the universities and in the uh, incubators, the business incubators, and the businesses like the Cisco's and the Intel's uh, of the world are all clamoring to develop new technology, new, new applications to run on this national broadband network. So across health, education, community, like e-government, e-procurement, uh, business, teleworking, cloud services, which I'll talk a little bit about, and of course entertainment. Uh, there, are, there are a variety of applications on the drawing board now that are being worked on in anticipation of this network being uh, completed. I just want to put the spend into context because I think the spend does tend to be controversial. We're asking the government over a 10-year period for $27 million 
the network will cost $35 billion to build over a 10 year period and it will last the nation four to five decades in our estimation. If you take that $36 billion that we cost in total, 27 of which comes from the taxpayers, and divide that over the 10 year bill, the roughly 10 year bill, it's about $3.6 billion a year. I just thought it would be interesting to contrast that with what's spent on education and health services in the nation at the moment $103 billion in health, $66 billion in education. Our business case says that we'll return to taxpayers the 7% return over the life of the asset. That's not a commercial return, let's not kid ourselves. No private sector enterprise can undertake this project based on a 7% return. <coughs> but we will return the money to taxpayers. Over and above that, you only need a small bit of productivity gain in areas like health and education through telemedicine, uh, uh, e-education, e-learning. You only need a small bit of productivity gain in just those two areas that I've mentioned in order to justify this expenditure without even talking about the benefits yet to business. Another statistic which puts the spend into context too, as I mentioned, $35 billion, 27 of which comes from taxpayers. The Australian government has returned to taxpayers in tax cuts $47 billion over the last three years. So these are just numbers that I'm throwing out there that provide some context for what sounds like and is a very expensive project. But in context, given the benefits it can derive and given other areas of government activity, I just think you know, it is worth mentioning that it's not a lot for what the nation is buying. So I've got a couple of case studies to present to you today because, as I mentioned, uh, the network is live in three communities in Tasmania now. They're quite remote places. You can see where uh, Smithton is in Tasmania, and yet they're experiencing the benefits today of 100 megabit per second broadband connections in a place like, um, in a place like Smithton. So I'm very fearful that of course I hope that this will work. Circular Head Christian School in Smithton, Tasmania, is one of the first schools in Australia to be connected to the National Broadband Network. Head teacher Patrick Bates tells us that Superfast Broadband is helping students of all ages to learn. So the National Broadband Network is meant that we can download information very really quickly. The same thing with money from text work, all the early years of reading the web page. You've now got all of the multimedia that comes packaged into the internet and through the NBN. Anything that allows them to access the technology effectively enhances learning, so the NBN is doing that. But the great potential 